Uh, thank you, everyone, for your patience. We are pleased to be getting restarted again with our panel on. Uh, we were trying to come up with a name for our discussion of uh, the USMCA, and we came up with uh, the art of the deal. And uh, uh, we, we certainly know what that means in the context of the United States. We're pleased to, to have a, a trinational panel here today. Uh, our good friend, uh, Eric Farnsworth from the Council of the Americas. Thank you, Eric, for joining us uh, again at WIDA for moderating this discussion. Ken Smith Ramos, a former WIDA board member, former uh, Mexican uh, lead uh, ne negotiator on, on uh, USMCA. Uh, Perrin Beatty from the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and Ambassador Miriam Sapiro. thank you so much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to today's conversation. Eric? Ken, thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see all of you for a discussion on trade. There's no community in the United States that would show up at this time in the morning to talk about trade except Washington. So we uh, congratulate you for that. Uh, I also want to thank Ken for pulling this outstanding group together, the panelists. I'm looking forward very much to working with all of you this morning and learning from you. Uh, and indeed, you don't just put uh, community in trade community, you also put trade in Washington. And that is critically important. Uh, during these particularly interesting times, and we've already heard a little bit about that from uh, Mr. Brady earlier this morning. So it gives me a real, uh, it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to join all of you. As Ken said, I am Eric Farnsworth. I head the Washington Office of the Council of the Americas. For those of you who don't know us, and I can't believe anybody out there might not know us, but uh, if you don't, uh, we're an organization that uh, promotes the uh, democratic and open markets and development agenda for the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but we've also been deeply engaged since before there was a NAFTA in NAFTA and now the USMCA in promoting the idea that North America is a natural unified economic space that collectively we need to do more to integrate and promote. And that's what brings us here this morning for this very interesting conversation on the USMCA and how uh, that might move forward. You have the biographic information, I trust, for all of the panelists. If we spent time actually introducing them, it would take our full time because each one of them has a very distinguished record, each one being a representative of uh, one of the three respective countries of North America, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, and so we uh, intend to have a, a good discussion along those lines as well. Uh, and uh, you know, you all know the background, obviously, of the USMCA and how we got to where we are right now. As all of you are no doubt aware, after over a year of negotiations, the agreement was signed uh, at the margins of the G20 in Argentina uh, on November 30th by President Trump and former President of Mexico Enrique Peña Nieto and Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada. And now, two months later, we're looking forward to see how can the business community come together to help promote ratification in all three countries, not just the United States, uh, moving forward to uh, implement uh, this very, very important agreement. The one thing I would say is that uh, during these politically polarized times, it's really important, I believe, personally, that all of us find a way to move forward. There are going to be some issues that we may agree on or may disagree on, but the point is there are bigger issues at stake here, and the idea of North America and the competitiveness of North America is ultimately what we're talking about, and that's what I want to focus on today in terms of a hub for investment and innovation and growth and leadership in the global economy. And so I want to start with Ken Smith Ramos. Ken and I have known each other for about 100 years, I don't know, uh, <laughs> give or take. Uh, but Ken has been somebody who not only uh, knows us better than we know ourselves, I must say, uh, but he has been, he was the lead negotiator for Mexico of the USMCA. And so I want to start from that perspective. The idea has been talked about that this is a fundamentally different agreement from NAFTA, uh, and that may or may be true, but I'd like you to explain what is different about this agreement and, and what should we focus on as we're looking in terms of trying to promote it uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, thank you to WIDA, to Ken, for the invitation to be here in this distinguished panel. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be back in Mexico. It just seems like a couple of days ago that we were running around <laughs> back and forth from USTR to our hotels and the embassy. And so it's great to be back here to discuss what we see as the steps forward in the USMCA and, as you say, some of the key results. 
For Mexico, it was key going into this negotiation that the main objectives that we had presented to our Senate uh, be followed throughout the negotiation. And, and those were very clear. You know, on the one hand, we were looking to uh, build upon 25 years of successful free trade. So we wanted to strengthen regional competitiveness, uh, no backtracking in terms of what we had achieved in the NAFTA, going back to tariffs, going back to managed trade, creating new non-tariff barriers, etc. We also wanted to modernize and upgrade the agreement because it was an agreement that tw was 25 years old. So we needed to have an upgrade, but it also needed to have an upgrade. And that's sort of the third pillar that we had, which was trying to make this agreement more inclusive, more sustainable, and, and really analyzing with a bit of self-criticism, where did we fall short in the original NAFTA? And so we, you saw a lot of things that we did in strengthening competitiveness. We did not uh, establish any mechanisms that manage trade. We have free trade uh, throughout the agreement. This was important because you look at some of the proposals that the US had put on the table originally, and throughout many sectors, including the automotive sector, sector, textiles, government procurement, agriculture, there were proposals on the table to restrict our access into the U.S. and also in the Canadian market, but primarily uh, in the U.S., and we were able to do away with that, so we preserve free trade. When it came to modernizing, we obtained strong results. You look at the 34 chapters of the, of the USMCA, 14 of those are essentially modernizing chapters. They are either new chapters that were not included in the original NAFTA, such as SMEs, anti-corruption, good regulatory practices digital trade, but also an upgrade to the existing discipline. So, uh, you know, we have, in addition to, to these sort of new modernization chapters, we brought in the labor and environmental side agreements as key elements of the, of the agreement. So, so not only do we strengthen the disciplines in labor and environment, but we bring it in as an essential part of the agreement, subject to full dispute settlement. So we really put teeth in these uh, provisions, and that's where we begin to work towards making the agreement more inclusive, more sustainable. Introducing disciplines, I said, as an anti-corruption chapter, which is very important for Mexico from the perspective of strengthening what we're trying to do domestically with strong international disciplines, as well as a chapter on SMEs. How do we internationalize SMEs and help them develop opportunities throughout the world? So it was very important to bring in those three key elements, like I said, competitiveness, modernizing the agreement and making it more responsible and sustainable. And the fourth big pillar was preserving the legal certainty of the, of the agreement. So, and, and that had to do with maintaining and strengthening the dispute settlement mechanisms in NAFTA, which was another proposal that the U.S. put on the table at the beginning, which was essentially dismantling the protections for, to, uh, to investors, uh, Chapter 20 and Chapter 19. And you know how those turned out. At the end of the day, from where we were at the beginning of the negotiation to where we are now, we have a solid agreement where we strengthen some of the chapters I really believe are the most advanced in any FTA up to date, including TPP, and, 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 and it borrows from different negotiations that Mexico has participated in recently with Europe, with the Pacific Alliance. You have chapters such as the SPS chapter, where we're really bringing a step forward in terms of having full science-based risk assessment when it comes to, uh, to SPS procedures, never putting in danger uh, either animal or plant health, but eliminating a lot of bureaucratic steps and trying to bring the process to be more expedite in terms of helping uh, facilitating trade in the ag sector. And I really believe that our customs procedures and trade facilitation chapter is the, the most advanced there is. So I think if you look at the totality of where we were in terms of the beginning of the negotiation where there was a real chance that we would not have a NAFTA and where we are now, we preserve free trade and we also modernize our agreement. So I think it's a positive result. So let me follow up the question that's undoubtedly on the minds of many, if not everybody in the audience, you were a representative of the government that no longer is in office, and obviously we have a new government now in Mexico. Does the vision that you've just laid out, is that uh, accepted or is that um, adopted by the government that is in power now in Mexico? Well, you know, throughout the negotiation, there was a question, what will Mexico do once the negotiation is extended beyond the initially planned six months, which very quickly became clear that because of the magnitude of what was being negotiated, there was no way to finish in six months. What would Mexico do if we got to the elections in July 1st, our presidential elections, and we're still negotiating? And I remember clearly exactly one year ago when we were freezing in the round in Montreal, <laughs> that Secretary Guajardo, my boss, uh, clearly told Ambassador Lighthizer and Minister Freeland that our mandate was to negotiate until November 30th, if, if need be. That was the last day of our administration. 
something like that wound up happening. You know, we, we, uh, we were clear that we wanted to close if there were the conditions to close, but that we would continue negotiating if need be after our elections. And we sent clear signals beginning in that round that no matter who won on July 1st, if we were still negotiating, we would incorporate the designated officials who, who, that would look at trade into the negotiation. And that's exactly what happened. After July 1st, we sat down with the designated officials that the, the, uh, the AMLO transition team uh, put together and they came to Washington with us and they sat down with us in the negotiations and this was important on two fronts. On the one hand because it sent a signal of unity between the outgoing government and the incoming administration vis-a-vis -vis the US and Canada so there was no way to sort of divide the positions and throughout the campaign in Mexico you know the, the three leading presidential candidates they disagreed pretty much on everything except on the NAFTA. They talked about preserving it, they talked about it being an, an, an important instrument and I think that's one of the uh, sort of uh, silver lining uh, effects of, of, of having such a controversial relationship with the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis NAFTA throughout the U.S. presidential campaign in the first year, uh, year of the Trump administration, that it really uh, created a sense of coalescing in Mexico around the, the NAFTA in a positive manner. So what we did is we brought them in, they worked with us, and so we presented a united front uh, with the U.S. And once we sign, it is useful now because the new government in Mexico can go to the Senate, which is a majority of the Morena party, and credibly say, I participated in this negotiation and the elements are in there go along the lines of our government program. Yeah, that's a really important point that you're making, and it's interesting to me that whereas in the United States trade sometimes is a divisive issue, in Mexico it seems to be a unifying issue, particularly during a very hyper-politicized moment, the presidential election. So uh, thank you for those views. We're going to come back to you, Ken, for greater insight into some additional topics as well. But I want to go to Perrin. I was uh, accusing him initially before the panel of bringing his Canadian weather down to us, and then he, he pulled out his uh, phone and showed me a picture of his house right now, which is under about nine feet of snow, uh, and, and he said, this is actually actually mild for me, so uh, I'm not going to use that bad joke, but uh, nonetheless, Perrin, we're delighted to have you back in Washington. Uh, you know, this is an election year in Canada as well, um, and so I kind of want to reverse the order of where I started with Ken. I went from substance to politics. I kind of want to go from politics to substance uh, in terms of the conversation with you. Um, how is this playing in Canada, and is this election year in Canada uh, going to be uh, directly impacted by the debate uh, on these uh, very, very important issues. Thanks, Eric, very much. First of all, let me thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, you're quite right about what it looks like in my driveway right now. I want you to know that <laughs> even though it says we only have 48 minutes to go, if any of you want to talk for the next 24 hours or so, <laughs> I'm prepared to stay and not go back to Ottawa tonight. Um, there is no more important issue for Canadians. It's something that we've watched with, with uh, great attentiveness over the course of uh, the last year and a half and great concern. Um, I have a somewhat different view, I suppose, of, of what we've negotiated. We, it's the first time I was in government, in cabinet at the time we negotiated the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and subsequently NAFTA. This is the first time that I can recall the Canadian government being part of negotiations, looking to negotiate something less than what we previously had. And I don't see USMCA, or as we refer, refer to it less musically in Canada, CUSMA. We put Canada <laughs> first with our acronym. Um, I don't see it as, as NAFTA 2.0. I see it more as NAFTA 0 .08, or 0 0.8. And uh, the, I think what we need to do, and I think we're, the way most Canadians see it, is we need to judge it not against our aspirations about what we wanted to see with taking down so many more barriers and integrating our economies that much more and stimulating that much more economic growth, but we have to judge it against what the option was that was, that was on the table. And the option was potentially a trade war between Canada and the US and the loss of, uh, of something that we'd worked very hard to, to build in our integrated economic base in, in North America. Um, what do we expect in this election year? I don't anticipate difficulties passing the current agreement in Canada. It will go first to our House of Commons and then from there to the Senate. Both of the main parties in Parliament, the Liberals and the Conservatives, are strongly in favour of, uh, of the agreement. And uh, I don't anticipate that it would take great time to pass Parliament. Nor will it be a major issue in the election campaign because both major parties support it. I don't anticipate we'll get ahead of the American pro process, though. We want to know what it is we're voting on, 
And so we'll have to wait and see what happens with the process in Congress before moving it ahead in Parliament. One thing that, that should be kept in mind, though, in Washington is that we have a fixed election date for our elections in October of this year. Parliament will sit till the end of June and then rises. It will not have the capacity to ratify after June. And so we could very well find, if the process is slow here in Washington, that in Ottawa it gets bumped until after the election. And uh, it just becomes that much more cumbersome and, un and uncertain. So that's where the process sits at the, um, at the present time. The other key issue that I want to put on the table, though, as well, is that, is that while we should be looking to expedite passage of, uh, of COSMA or uh, USMCA or NAFTA II uh, as rapidly as possible, from a Canadian perspective, the issue doesn't end there. We have steel and aluminum quotas still in place. The, Prime Minister, the President face-to-face -face with our Prime Minister said those would be lifted if there was an agreement. And representatives of the administration in a number of different instances signaled a very similar signal that it was very clear that, this, that those steel and aluminum tariffs were being used as negotiating leverage to force Canada to the table to an agreement uh, to replace NAFTA. We have that agreement. The basis on which those uh, tariffs are imposed, ostensibly national security, are on the face of it illogical, illegal, and self-defeating at the end of the day. I'm a former defense minister in Canada. We have deliberately built between our two countries, who are partners in NATO and in NORAD, we have built an integrated defense industrial base. We backstop each other. The Canadian capacity in steel and aluminum is a backstop to the U.S. It's not a threat to U.S. security. It's something that strengthens U.S. security, and anything that undermines that shared defense industrial base diminishes the national security of, of, both, of, our, of both of our countries. So that the rationale for it we see as an excuse that avoided having to go to Congress, but which doesn't provide a sound legal or, or moral or political foundation for having it. And good faith would argue that, that those tariffs should come off now. So that's the nature of the political yeah. debate at this point in Canada. Well, I'm really glad you brought those latter two points up. And I'm going to go to Mary in, in a, just a bit to talk about 232, among other topics. But um, the idea of Canada and the United States uh, having this bigger agenda, bigger vision, bigger history together, bigger political union, to me, is, uh, is fundamental. And I'm really glad that you raised that. And truthfully, Ken, we're developing that, or we have been developing that over previous years with Mexico, too. And this is a, certainly a trend that I think uh, uh, steel tariffs against two of our closest neighbors and friends uh, is self-defeating in that, in that regard. Let me pick up a couple things, though, you said in terms of the obstacles, or you implied obstacles, that you weren't going to get. Or, not you, I'm sorry, Canada's not going to get ahead of the U.S. process, and I think that's absolutely right. Tease that out a little bit. Does that mean that the Canadian Parliament, you don't think, would take a vote before the U.S. Congress or simply before the bill is introduced into the U.S. Congress? Or what does that actually mean in the context of not getting ahead of the United States? I think we want to know what we're voting on. Yeah. Um, when, we, when Parliament passes it, it becomes, becomes binding on Canada. Sure. Well, if we're voting on something that is going to be changed, what is the point of doing that? We need to know what, the, what in fact, the agreement is. And uh, it makes it a real challenge. We had similar issues uh, with our uh, trade agreement, CETA, with Europe. And it reminded me of Henry Kissinger's question once about when you want to talk to Europe, who do you call? Um, what we found was all sorts of, of different interests, including at the state level in Belgium, uh, putting new conditions on any approval of, of CETA. We want to know in this instance what, in fact, is the agreement going to be that we're asked to, to uh, put our name to. And, and I judge, this is me speaking, not you, but I judge by your comments that you probably think there's not a lot of flexibility from the Canadian perspective in terms of any sort of renegotiation or any, you know, adopting new provisions or anything like that to the agreed text. I, I don't think we have to tell anybody in this room that the difficulty becomes when you start picking at the threads yeah. of the fabric, yeah. it starts to unravel. Uh, other people start putting their own demands on the table and uh, other problems uh, come up. I think in this particular instance, we should take the money and run. It, this is not, it's far from perfect, but uh, it is the best that we're going to get. 
let's do it. And the other point is this, that for members of the business community, there's nothing that is more worrisome than uncertainty. If you're going to make a multi-billion dollar investment, you want to know what the rules are. And if we go back, plunge ourselves back into uncertainty about what the relationship is going to be, what you'll see is members of the business community sitting on their wallets, holding back from making investments or making investments in other countries where there's greater certainty. It is not in the interests of any of our three countries to, to delay. If I can put a, another, smuggle in another contentious point here that, 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 that I think needs to be on the table and, and you know, I wish I didn't have to raise. The nature of the bilateral re relationship has been changed as a result of these negotiations. Um, I was part of the most pro-American administration probably in, in our modern history in, in Canada. And the prevailing view of the bilateral relationship, you know, when I was foreign minister, I said only half facetiously that, that Canada has two international relationships. There's the relationship with the United States and the relationship with the rest of the world. If any of your businesses did 70% of your business with one customer, you would take it pretty seriously and uh, you would give it a lot of, uh, of attention. And the prevailing worldview about the bilateral relationship between Canada and the United States over the course of the last, you know, since the 1980s certainly, uh, has been that, that our futures are so integrated, we share so much in terms of our values, in terms of our interests, in terms of our history, and in terms of blood, that uh, th there was simply a symbiosis between the two countries. We couldn't conceive the thought that it would ever be in the interests of one country when we're in the same boat together to shoot holes in the hull of the other side of the boat that both of us would, would suffer. Um, the lesson that we've learned is, is that we've had an administration that, that has wanted to inflict economic damage on Canada. It, it did that for negotiating purposes with steel and aluminum. There were threats against our car sector and others. It means then that the comfortable assumption that we've had that, that we are in it together and, and our goal is how do we take this relationship forward more solidly and, and build upon it, that this can't be taken for granted anymore. And that we need to work at the relationship. The only other point I'd make related to this is that administrations on either side of the border come and go. But the relationship between our peoples and our business community is solid and it continues to solidify every day. So we need to take a long <coughs> view that goes beyond the politics of the day and to realize that the interests of our, of our countries are in fact inextricably linked even if, if we're in a, a very difficult period right now. Yeah, the scenario that you pointed is something that a number of us have pointed to for a long time is a real risk uh, of this certain approach. And when you're talking the art of the deal, I mean, what deal are we talking about? Are we talking a specific narrow negotiation or are we talking an overall bilateral relationship or trilateral relationship that has to exist beyond any particular administration? So again, very well made points. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I should have called you from the beginning, but uh, Perrin nonetheless. Uh, Miriam, to you. Um, let's refocus now on Washington. Uh, this is Washington. It's a Washington-based audience, what we are? Uh, indeed. And uh, uh, no doubt there are a lot of questions uh, following up uh, from uh, Mr. Brady's comments and looking in terms of the very complicated political environment we face now. We just have a government shutdown we got out of. We might be going into another one before too long. Um, you know, as a former trade negotiator and as a Democrat, and I'm saying that on purpose, how do you view this in the context of trying to move a very complicated agreement, even in normal times or different times, let's put it that way, uh, through a divided Congress which doesn't necessarily look forward to cooperating with this particular White House. Is there a magic bullet here? Is there something we should think about? Is there something we should be aware of? Help us out thinking through this very complicated issue. Well, it's great to be here with you and everyone, and thank you all for getting up on what could be a snowy day. We'll see. Um, <laughs> snow by DC standards, I know it doesn't compare to Ottawa. Um, let me, I'm gonna um, go out on a limb here and say that I think um, NAFTA is like, sorry, 
<laughs> Just rolls off US the tongue. USMCA, <laughs> TMEC, right, in Mexico, or CUSMA, I like Cusma. that. I'm going to start saying CUSMA. <laughs> um, I've got to be careful around, well, my kids are older now, but they think I was going to cuss or something. Um, so I, I think I, it's fair to say that um, this agreement is likely to pass more quickly um, than Mexico will pay for a border wall. <laughs> how's that? How's that for optimism? That's a good headline. I have to agree with that. Press yeah. clip tomorrow. <laughs> my, I, I think what's important, and and my colleagues have uh, foreshadowed this, is that the U.S. worked very hard to do it this year, and actually because of the Canadian elections, um, it really needs to be in the next five months. And we've seen just in the last few weeks how difficult it is uh, to get. It's, it's not so much Republicans and Democrats. It's because w with, within each party, you have all kinds of views now. And it's getting enough of a majority in both houses together to try to get this through. Fortunately, we do have TPA, so it would be an up or down vote. Um, it's also important to get it through the U.S. Uh, this year because our presidential election has virtually started the day after our midterm election in November. And it's only a year and a couple days away where um, we're going to see the first uh, votes taken in the Democratic uh, primaries at the Iowa caucuses, which are February 2nd, 2020. So there isn't a lot of time. What can help? Well. My colleagues won't want to hear this, but I think it would help if Mexico and Canada could pass the agreement first for two reasons. First of all, that puts more pressure on the Congress to consider it in a timely fashion. And second of all, it actually makes it harder for anybody to speak seriously about reopening the text. I also think um, the fact that so far there are within the US context. There are different kinds of concerns on both sides of the aisle, among different interest groups. It's actually a good thing. Um, because if you had one side very happy with it, then obviously the other side would be less so. But again, there aren't really sides anymore. So for example, um, there have been concerns raised about the ISDS provisions. Um, almost complete elimination, not complete, but carved back to a certain extent. Um, with respect to what sectors are now eligible and then eventually um, being phased out completely with Canada. Um, there are also concerns raised about the enforceability of the labor provisions, the environmental provisions, and enforcement um, overall. Um, there's also uh, concerns um, that have been raised about drug pricing, um, not just in the US, but also uh, in, in Canada and Mexico. And then just this week, we saw the Heritage uh, Foundation come out with a report uh, with concerns about LGBT rights and environmental uh, enforceability. So my point is that there is a range of issues coming out, and that's healthy. Hopefully, later today, we'll see a draft of the administration's implementing bill. Uh, it may not be terribly long. That's OK. But maybe that will give Canada and Mexico some comfort. Um, that they can start their, their processes. I think Mexico is willing to move more quickly, at least the new ambassador signaled out when she spoke uh, recently. So maybe that will provide the kind of, of um, fire that, that we need to light if we're going to have any chance of getting this through. So one of the things that uh, we've heard repeatedly, Perrin raised it, um, um, Ken didn't, but I know it was on his mind, uh, is 232. And so to the extent that Mexico and Canada quote unquote, should or need or want to go first, there is an obvious complication here because 232 still exists. And my question, it's not a fair question to you, Miriam, I admit that up front because you don't have the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway so you can help us think it through anyway. Everybody says this has to go. Everybody says it should have gone already. Uh, why hasn't it? And what do we foresee in terms of when and if 232 will be lifted? Well, steel and aluminum tariffs is what exactly. I mean. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you know, our steel and aluminum industries have been hurting for a while now. And, you know, the reason is not because of Canada, it's not because of Mexico. Um, but the president realized that he had a fairly blunt instrument and he wanted uh, to use it. 
So I think what's important here is to really focus on the problem and how together we can address that problem. My sense is Canada and Mexico are very willing to do that. Um, Japan and the EU are as well, because again, it's a serious overcapacity um, problem that we're seeing uh, uh, you know, based on production continuing in, in China. So, so, so that's the real challenge here. And it, it may be that that could provide the kind of incentive that Canada and Mexico need to move more quickly to ratification. So I, I think all of us are waiting to see what will the administration do. Um, certainly the signal was that the tariffs would not remain if the agreement was reached, the agreement's been reached. So perhaps that can be part of the sequencing in order to actually see the agreement move from conclusion to actually ratification in all three countries and then to implementation. As you signaled, um, you know, when I was a, a young official at the National Security Council, we were always very proud to say the longest undefended border in the entire world is between the US and Canada. Yeah. And we want to keep it that way. <laughs> so, and our partnership with Mexico could not be stronger. So again, how do we deal with that problem, um, which should not um, keep us from moving forward to, to ratify the new agreement? Can I say something? You may, absolutely. I, I and then I'm going to come to you with an actual question, so go ahead. Thank you. Now, very quickly, just wanted to say that, you know, trying to resolve the 232 steel and aluminum um, issue is one of the first big tests, I think, for the new Mexican administration. Because I agree, uh, you know, it's something that should get resolved, uh, uh, you know, hopefully prior to the process of ratification in the three countries. And it's something that in the previous administration we try to do is separate it from the actual NAFTA negotiation. So we said we're not going to ask the U.S. to take away these tariffs that we found to be completely unjustified. And as Perrin was explaining, we strengthen U.S. national security, both Mexico and Canada, in the sphere of a steel and aluminum trade and in many other spheres as well. So it's completely unjustified. So we're not going to include that in the discussions of the NAFTA negotiations because we don't need to pay for for it, right? For for these to go away, so we wanted to do it before November 30th. It, it could not uh, get done for for a number of reasons, but I think it is essential that uh, the Mexican government, and I'm sure in Canada they're thinking along the same lines of doing away with this, because the road of cooperation it was is what has worked in the past. You know, we created the North American Steel Trade Committee within the NAFTA structure in 2003. We have been working the OECD, high-level dialogue on steel. That's the way to go if we want to address a problem that affects our three countries, but we should not be fighting with each other. Well, and as Miriam says, there is global overcapacity. That, I think that's a fact, but the question is how do you address that best? Exactly. And, and so that's a topic perhaps for another day, but clearly I think all three of you have alluded to, to similar comments. Well, it, it, I, I think you, you put the point very well. That there is certainly overcapacity in steel. We're all suffering from that. Right. The question is where is it coming from? It's coming from China. Of course. Mm -hmm. And with previous administrations, what you would have found was that they would be reaching out to their trading partners and saying, how do we work together of course. to address the problem created by, by China, the great irony is that the people who are most hit by the steel and aluminum tariffs are not the Chinese, it's your closest neighbor. And uh, uh, it also means that, that what you don't have is an international common front in dealing with China on an issue that, that is so fundamental. If I can just flag another, another point as well here that, that, that I think is worth putting on the table, it's that I think what we're seeing with, with uh, USMCA is a move away from free trade in a conventional sense. All uh, trade agreements are managed trade in one form or another. They set all sorts of, of rules. But what we're seeing taking place is, is the U.S. moving much more aggressively into a system of managed trade and away from conventional free trade. Uh, what they negotiated with uh, Korea, for example, is very much managed trade and very strict in, in each of the categories that are involved there. Some of the discussions that are taking place with regard to, well, what could replace steel and aluminum tariffs in North America would put in place, again, a very rigid system of managed trade. What we have in the case of autos to avoid, uh, to, to avoid tariffs on autos is, again, moving to a system that is more rigidly uh, structured managed trade. Um, and I, th I think one of the issues that we need to look at as a business community is, now, do we want to see strictly managed trade, or do we believe in the principle of free trade where the market decides? 
Yeah, no, again, well said, and I'd love to take that tangent and run with it as well. It's, uh, it's a very, very important point. Um, but I do want to come back to the investment question, Ken, because one of the things, particularly from our perspective uh, at the Council, but also others, is that we have seen trade not just in terms of the benefits of exchange of goods and services, but also as a critically important means toward development and the idea of supporting uh, good jobs in all the trade partners. Uh, and that clearly has been, as I understand it, the idea as well of many Mexican governments, the idea that investment comes in, creates jobs um, where Mexicans are, and Mexicans don't migrate to the United States. And in fact, we have net zero migration now from Mexico to the United States. Migration issues, as an aside, are from Central America, not Mexico. And I would say that NAFTA has a large responsibility for that in a positive way. But my question is then, if you take that, and you can feel free to disagree with my assumption, what I've just laid out, but if you agree with it, at least in whole or in part, game out for us, does the USMCA, based on investment provisions and prospects in the auto sector and other se important manufacturing sectors, does that risk some of the issues in Mexico put some of that development at risk and threaten to regenerate some of the population flows that all of us here and many of you in the room have spent a generation trying to manage and address. Now you raise a very important point and definitely uh, the level of investment that we've been able to attract into Mexico over the last 25 years, the growth from a, an average of $2 billion in FDI to an average of almost 33 over the last six years in the last administration, is a reflection of clear rules, transparent mechanisms, free trade, and the prospect of long-term uh, stability when it comes to the relationship with our main trading partners. So that's, that's without a doubt. I think we were able to avoid what would have gone in the direction of what you're saying, which is creating an environment that would threaten this, this stability by actually being able to convince the U.S. not to do away completely with the uh, ISDS provisions, right? I mean, we knew that this was a position that the U.S. government was putting on the table that did not have the support of the U.S. business community or of the U.S. Congress, right? So, uh, you know, for a very long time in the negotiation, I would say the first nine months of this 14-month period, it, uh, the, the U.S. would not move on that. And finally, you know, they began to do so, I think, because of domestic pressure as well. And uh, we wound up in a situation in which we were able to preserve, I mean, it's, this is the world upside down, right? Mexico <laughs> being the demandeur of something that in the original NAFTA we were not pushing <laughs> forward, but that we found to be a very useful instrument to guarantee investor protection in, in North America. So I think what we obtain is, is a, a solid ISDS mechanism. We have the ISDS mechanism between Mexico and Canada that is uh, strengthened in the TPP. So as far as we are concerned. We have ISDS provisions in the different trade agreements that we have in place. Uh, we strengthen that in TPP with Canada. We were able actually to obtain some elements that are very important in the Mexican context in the USMCA, which is the issue of those sectors, guaranteeing sort of the ISDS plus for those sectors that are key, such as energy, telecommunications, transportation, where a lot of the investment is going in and a lot of the objectives of long-term growth in Mexico is investing in those sectors. So for us, it was key to preserve that. So I don't see in the USMCA any elements that backtrack mm. on, on uh, you know, the promotion and attraction of investment. What we do need to continue guaranteeing in Mexico is the right domestic policies that continue to create that environment. So that has to accompany, just as we've always said, trade agreements by themselves don't provide the solution to all of the challenges of economic growth in a country. They have to be accompanied by the right domestic policies that promote investment and guarantee this growth and better employment, better paid employment. Yeah, that's that's a great point, and obviously that's a forward look in terms of now the responsibility of the new government in Mexico exactly. and what they might be thinking of doing. Just a very quickly, have you seen whether because of uncertainty of the new government's economic plan or uncertainty about USMCA or some exogenous factor, have you seen a slowdown of investment into Mexico recently, or is that uh, too recent to, to, to know at this point what's happening there? I think the support of the new government for the uh, USMCA negotiation process and then once it, it was assigned has sent a positive signal throughout the world. I think there are other signals that have occurred domestically, such as the cancellation of the airport project, one of the ma major infrastructure projects in Latin America, and a few other things that have been occurring in terms of domestic public policy, a little bit on the ag sector as well, have been sending signals that 
you know, could be perceived as contradictory vis-a-vis -vis a country that is sending signals that it wants to continue pushing in the right direction on, on investment. But when we speak to the officials that took over, let's say, in Economia, you know, Luz Maria de la Mora coming in as undersecretary, she's someone who, you know, we worked alongside the NAFTA negotiations for many, many years. She defended Mexico's interests from a perspective of keeping Mexico as an, as an open economy that negotiates trade agreements and implements them correctly. So in Economia, there is the, the, the right push in the right direction. Then you have other ministries where we will see where things go. For example, in, in the Ministry of Agriculture, they created an undersecretary for food self-sufficiency. So the question is, how do you match what Economia is going to be pushing forward with what we see in the Ministry of Agriculture? And the key is who wins the debate within the cabinet and who convinces the president to go in a particular direction. The signals that are being sent, I think, are mixed. But at the same time, when it comes to trade policy, there seems to be a willingness to, to continue with a policy of, of, of an open environment. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, that will win the day in terms mm -hmm. of the internal debate. Yeah, no, thank you very much for those comments. Perrin, I want to uh, go to you now from the Canadian perspective. And in about a few short minutes, we will have the opportunity to go to you for the questions that you might have for the panelists as well. And I'm sure you have many uh, based on the outstanding conversation we've already been having uh, with three true experts. Um, Perrin, we've talked in macro terms about US-Canada in the USMCA. I'd like to drill down a little bit to the micro. Can you give us a sense of some of the wins that you see from the Canadian perspective in the agreement? Are there some sectors that you think are coming out on top? I mean, you made a comment about you know, NAFTA 0.8. Uh, that, you know, that's a provocative comment. Are there, but, but surely everybody hasn't lost in this discussion. Are there f sectors that have won or at least uh, uh, held the line? Or how, how are you seeing it? Or let me put it differently. How, are, how is Canadian business seeing this uh, particular agreement, if you can speak from that perspective? The, the reaction within the Canadian business community when the announcement was made was relief as opposed to enthusiasm. Okay. And there's a big difference between the two. So again, the issue was what might have, what nasty things might have been as opposed to what very positive things might have been. Uh, when we got into this, uh, the Canadian Chamber, the U.S. Chamber, and our colleagues in Mexico put out a, a joint statement. Our, the first principle was first do no harm, that, and that would, second that we should be ambitious and try to negotiate something that was deeper and, and, and uh, stronger. Um, unfortunately, ultimately, your expectations come down considerably from there. Um, the, the, the fact is, the very good thing about this is that it relieves a good deal of the uncertainty that, that existed prior to it. There was a very real possibility that we could have seen that in addition to various trade actions that have been taken against, against uh, coated papers, against softwood lumber, whole range of other areas, the, the uh, tariffs against steel and aluminum, that we could have seen a very nasty fight over automobiles. And uh, that would have been extremely damaging. It, it harkens back to, it, and Canada would have responded as Canada responded in the steel and aluminum quotas, the tariffs, which are, and both the tariffs themselves put on by the United States and the counter tariffs put on by Canada damage the business communities in both of our countries. Um, the fact is that the counter tariffs that we've put on drive up the cost of doing business for Canadian businesses as well and for Canadian consumers. That's what, what we could have seen as well in the automotive sector, and it would have been truly ugly. So uh, there was a genuine sense of, of relief. Uh, when this is passed and put into law, I think everybody will be, will be pleased uh, with that uh, because it will at least give a greater sense of confidence yeah. for what the rules are. Yeah, no, I think, Ben, that's a, that's a very important point. Certainty, forward look, rules of the game, relatively secure until it's renegotiated in six years or whatever it is. That's another joke. <laughs> no, just kidding. That's a joke, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Miriam, uh, my favorite question uh, that I've been holding uh, for you, um, you know, let's assume that the agreement does pass as written, no particular major revisions. Uh, you know, we get through this complicated moment. We get to 218 in the House, and we move forward. Will this agreement do what the president says it's going to do uh, in the context of job creation in the United States, 
in the context of reducing trade deficits with Mexico, in the context of, and here's the real question, taking NAFTA out of the political discourse so we can forget about blaming the troubles of the entire universe on NAFTA and simply move forward in the political debate, Obviously a provocative, unfair question to you, but, but we have such a good long-standing relationship, I'm not afraid to, of doing it. But this is a question that I continue to wrestle with in my own mind, even if we go through all this you know, moving heaven and earth to get this thing passed, and we're, we are doing that. Everybody here is committed to it, I imagine, and we're moving forward. But at the end of the day, where does that leave us? Well, I think it'll be a huge accomplishment if this agreement does get through um, all three countries' ratification process this year, if not the first half of this year. It's going to be a major lift, and as was said earlier, it's going to require help from everybody in this room to, to happen. Uh, and there may be some tweaks. I mean, you know, it, it, as you said, you, you need the magic number in the U.S. of 235, uh, sorry, uh, 218 um, in the House and 51 in the Senate. So you look at the math and you figure, well, if I do a side arrangement on this, can I get another 10 votes, whatever. And so you, you need, you, you know, sometimes it's nice to get overwhelming support. Um, but again, I think we'll take a simple majority. Um, and we saw that with uh, Colombia, Panama, and Korea, which um, uh, Congressman Brady referenced. Um, we, the Obama administration actually ended up getting much stronger support than we had originally uh, been hopeful for, um, for all three agreements. But we did do various things to make them more palatable. Uh, Panama didn't involve anything, just some understandings with Panama, um, you know, that were not even officially reduced to writing. Uh, Colombia, we did have some understandings that were reduced to writing regarding uh, labor, the labor action plan. And with Korea, there were some tweaks to the actual agreement, but that was a much older agreement than NAFTA. So I think, you know, as my colleagues both said, this was a, a hard fought agreement and, and, and nobody's interested in seeing it, it changed. I would say, in terms of your question, what next? So it'll be, it'll be a, lo a lovely miracle if we get through that. And I, I think there's a path to do it, as we've each uh, outlined. Um, but what will be the next boogeyman, right? Will we then you know, be able to blame USMCA in six years when we have a review period, or 16 years when it could be terminated uh, for new ills? I certainly hope not. I've always looked at trade agreements as each one builds on the last one. At least that's the theory. And there are certainly things in here that are better than NAFTA. Um, there are new provisions on digital, uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, SMEs, as, as Ken said, and other provisions. Um, there are some areas where I don't think people would consider it to be an improvement. Um, but we compare it to the alternative of not having NAFTA. Because as we know, the president was serious when he said that he was ready to withdraw uh, at various times during the negotiating phase when the three parties were barely talking to each other. So the fact that in just over a year, three extraordinary teams, and all of us know people on all the teams, they really did an incredible job in a very short period of time for the complexity that's involved in a trade agreement of getting to the finish line. So I certainly hope that this doesn't become sort of an annual or semi-annual um, chore. Let's renegotiate USMCA, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I think if we can pass it, it should be set for a while. I think your other question is, you know, what does it mean for US trade policy overall is an interesting one in, in two senses. First of all, when this agreement was reached, first US-Mexico, but more importantly, US-Mexico-Canada, because almost everybody always thought this needed to be a three-way uh, agreement, um, I thought it also sent an important signal to other countries that the U.S. could cut a deal when it felt that it was the best alternative. So for much of the negotiation, the U.S. had tried to persuade the other parties to adopt its view, and it wasn't uh, going to offer many flexibilities. I think when the U.S. realized that wasn't working, um, they realized that they had to be a little bit more flexible on some key issues, the other parties then together the three teams were able to reach an agreement. So I think that shows other countries, whether it's China or the EU or Japan, that when there's something that's um, give and take, uh, we, we can actually get, get, get to yes. I, I think the other um, signal that I hope it sends, or we'll see about this, is the point you made apparent about managed trade. That is not 
normally a U.S. trade objective. Um, unfortunately, the concept of trade agreements has gotten conflated with the U.S. trade deficit to the point where I think some people actually believe we have a deficit with Canada, which, sorry, we don't. <laughs> it's one of the few countries where we can say that. Um, although when you add in services, it's not, uh, it, it, it's not that rare to say it with other countries as well. So I very much hope we'll be able to stop looking at our trade relationships as a zero-sum game based on our trade deficit, that we'll be able to look at issues like competitiveness, um, uh, like overall growth, uh, overall growth in jobs, um, which you know, manufacturing jobs have been expanding. Um, and we hope very much in the US, and also we'll see that continue in our trading partners. So I think we have to be a little optimistic here. Yeah, fabulous comments. Thank you for, uh, for dealing with a very difficult question very well. And, and just put a grace note on that to come back to what Ken said about the Mexican economy. I think that's true with all three economies, and indeed global economies. You know, trade policy is one contributor to overall economic health, but it's the domestic economic policies that fundamentally drive competitiveness. And so, you know, we can blame NAFTA or USMCA for various things, but there are in some ways bigger issues here, technology for one. I promised all of you the opportunity to jump into this conversation and we have a short period of time left. So let's take a lightning round of three questions, if there are three questions, and if you could uh, identify yourself and also direct the question to the panelist. If uh, it is a direct panelist, we'll start here. Uh, and then we will ask the panelists to uh, address the questions briefly, but also substantively. We'll start there, please. Good morning, Ellen Meinhart, um, Virginia's Export Promotion Program. I don't know if you have the answer to this, but can anybody address the e-commerce and fintech, how they've, in terms of the modernization of USMCA and what's been happening there? Yeah, important question. Thank you for that. Is there a second? Here we go. We'll go to Bill, and then we'll go back there for the third one. So we'll start, we'll go here. Yeah, uh, Bill Lane, Trade for America. Um, TPP just went into effect. Uh, I was wondering how is it working out, and uh, if at some point the U.S. does become a member, does that trump the um, USMCA? Yeah, really good question, Bill. Uh, back there, please, and then we will ask the panelists if they can do it quickly. We can do another round, but these are three excellent questions. I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> Hi, my name is Clarice Brown. I'm from the Geotechnology Division at Eurasia Group. I'm curious about the role of cross-border data flows in the USMCA. What are the provisions for it, and what are the, the challenges that you saw in the deal um, trying to outline something in regards to this? I'd like to Thank lump you. that one in with the first question on e-commerce. I think I know the two aren't the same, but they are related. Uh, so let's take a fourth, if there is one. There was a lady over on this side. Uh, I haven't looked at this side yet, so there was? There yep, isn't. Up against the wall. Up against, all right, way in the back there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this question is for the, for the Mexican uh, negotiator and the Canadian. Uh, one of the things that Democrats seem to want to reopen is the biologics um, period of exclusivity, and I wondered if Mexico and Canada would be willing to uh, make that a shorter period if that would be something they'd look at favorably. Very good, thank you. Miriam, I want you to deal, if you can, with the TPP question, because that's essentially a U.S. question. Uh, Ken, you were a negotiator of this agreement, so if you can deal with the e-commerce and uh, cross-borders and uh, also biologics, if you care to. And Perrin, uh, you can deal with any of those that you <laughs> care to. I will give you the smorgasbord to choose from. Uh, let's start with Ken. Thank you very much. Yeah, so basically I will lump in the uh, two questions that have to do with uh, e-commerce and cross-border data flows. What we try to do here, as you know, it's the first time that you have in the NAFTA uh, provision specifically on uh, digital trade. So the notion here was to concentrate on how to uh, facilitate digital trade, to establish provisions such as uh, no requirements for data localization. This was one of the uh, main elements. And it is related, even though there's no specific provisions that deal directly with the issue of, of fintech, we do have a, a link between the uh, digital trade provisions and the provisions that we have in the uh, financial services chapter, because there's also a data localization issue there that, uh, that, that was quite an issue for Canada and got resolved at the end of the negotiation. But basically, the environment that is set up in, in, through the, the USMCA is one where there's no restriction on data localization and where we look to establish 
uh, key guidelines or specific provisions that facilitate digital trade. Things that go from authenticating uh, electronic signatures, guaranteeing uh, cyber security and the, and the privacy of the information. Also in the discussions that had to do with the financial services and, and sort of macroeconomic issues in the, in the ser financial services chapter, uh, we dealt a lot with the issue of um, what happens in terms of, of countries needing to implement prudential measures in the financial sector and the availability of the financial information that may be located in servers that are outside of the country. So basically, in, in, in a nutshell, you have no restrictions in, in terms of uh, cross-border data flows or data localization, which I think puts us in a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis other regions that continue to establish these kinds of, uh, of limits. Uh, I will deal also with a biologics question, if you will. As you know, this is something that the US, since TPP and our previous administration, pushed actively in terms of, of, of establishing disciplines that had to do, deal with a, a new kind or new generation of products, which is a biologics. That, that was not dealt in the original NAFTA, where we have an overall five-year uh, protection you know, for, for pharmaceutical products. And it was increased in uh, TPP to eight years which is, well, essentially eight years or the five plus three, which you know all about that. And that was a key element in actually not getting TPP through the U.S. Congress uh, a few years back. But, uh, you know, we moved forward. We started the negotiation from the basis of saying, where do we stand, not in TPP, but in NAFTA, and working, uh, you know, from that point onwards. Uh, we arrived at a 10-year level, which was... Uh, pretty much at the borderline of what we think is establish a, a balance between what the innovators need to have a guarantee to be able to continue investing in the development of these products and ensuring that the population can get you know, biosimilars or, or the, the actual products in a reasonable period of time. I do not know whether there will be a, a positive reception by the US administration of a push to try to reopen that area. Uh, but as Perrin had mentioned before, the problem we have, even though in Mexico we may have people that are in, in, maybe in favor of reducing the time frame for biologics, the problem with reopening the text is that you start touching different balances that are in there, right? So the question will be, if that is to be reopened, what other elements can come unraveled as well? So it would be very difficult, I think, first of all, for the U.S. administration to accept reopening that. We had heard uh, in other areas that the Democrats would be concerned perhaps with the labor chapter and trying to strengthen provisions there. And I can tell you, and a lot of people in this room uh, know about it, this is the most advanced labor chapter there is in any FTA. I mean, if, if, if the Democrats had, had pushed for the exact same text a few years back, some people would have said, wow, it's in your wildest dreams that you're going to get something like that. I, I really think that we advance a lot. I think Mexico and Canada pushed actively so that the labor chapter that we have reflects in the case of Mexico, a lot of the reforms and the progress that we've made in the protection of worker rights over the last 25 years. And so that's why we have a state-of-the-art chapter. So I really don't think there's a lot of arguments to reopen that chapter or in the environmental area. Uh, but of course, we'll be faced with a lot of domestic U.S. policies uh, push back and forth. But I, I see it as a complicated outcome in terms of looking at reopening the agreement overall. Yeah. Uh, Miriam and Perrin, we have approximately five minutes or less, so we're going to have to wrap this up. But in two or three minutes, Miriam, the TPP question, and Perrin, a last thought to you. Yeah. Um, let me just say, Ken's made a very important point. So clearly, um, this was a very hard-fought negotiation on all sides. If you try to reopen the text of the agreement, I think a lot of people will be pushing for changes in different directions, and it essentially would mean there's nothing to try and ratify this year. And the default mechanism isn't necessarily the old NAFTA, but then whether the president follows through on his threat to terminate NAFTA. And so then the result could be nothing. Some people may feel that's a good result, but I think many more people would feel that that was unfortunate. Um, on TPP, um, I'll speak as an observer since the US is not a party. Um, it's important that the other parties went ahead uh, with the agreement. Um, I would be interested to hear from my colleagues how they think it's working so far. The path clearly was left open for the US to join. Some of the provisions that the US had very much wanted were stripped out of the agreement once the US indicated it would not join. I don't think that would happen under the Trump administration, um, despite some feelers the president did put out at one point last year. Um, but it could be something that the next administration looks at very seriously. Um, and then there would have to be adjustments made either to bring the US back into TPP um, and also with respect to 
USMCA, if it's passed, if it's uh, in force, um, just to make sure that, that any inconsistencies have been addressed. Spectacular, thank you. Short, Two sweet, minutes. to the point, and uh, you hit the time mark. Very well done, thank you. Perrin, to you. Let me try picking up on the TPP uh, question. Um, it's still very early with the agreement, and it's very hard to say exactly how it's going to how it's going to work out. But we're enthusiastic about it. From a Canadian perspective, uh, given how trade dependent we are, we are very grateful for the fact that it appears we have an agreement in North America. We do have an agreement with with TPP, which Canada takes the blame for renaming CPTPP. <laughs> It was awful. What's the acronym there? <laughs> so, is there one? It is awful. The Comprehensive and Progressive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and CETA, our agreement with Europe. So uh, That one I can say. It, this, it, I can manage that one, too. And the other sounds like a committee of the, of the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> um, so we're, we're enthusiastic about the fact that these agreements are there and we want to see them go ahead. Um, I believe part of the question was, what would it mean if the U.S. were to re-engage with, with TPP? What was interesting in the, in the negotiations on NAFTA was that a number of the, the positions taken by the Trump administration were taken out of TPP and put on the table uh, in the NAFTA negotiations. And so many of the things had already been won in TPP and had been agreed to uh, by Canada and by other, by other countries. Uh, those went off the table when the U.S. withdrew from TPP, but they came back onto the table when we got into negotiations on NAFTA. Uh, I would welcome, uh, you know, well we, have a, well, we have a favored position in, the, in that we have agreements you folks don't have and have entry into some markets that you don't have. I would welcome any sign out of Washington of moving back to a, to a more internationalist approach and to, to engaging in international multilateral uh, agreements. It, it, if I can simply end my comments here by saying the rest of the world needs the United States to be successful. We need American leadership. We need to be able to get behind that. Without that, you get chaos, chaos in markets, chaos diplomatically and militarily. And uh, any vacuum that the U.S. leaves, whether in trade or in, in military diplomatic areas, bad actors move in to, to fill that vacuum. So we need your re-engagement in, in a positive way, and I think all of us benefit uh, from American leadership and from successful American leadership. You'd think we scripted that last comment uh, to be the ending comment. We did not, but it was a fabulous way to end the panel. Uh, very, very well said. I want to thank uh, the panelists, not just for their comments this morning, but frankly their individual leadership on these issues. It's been a career-long endeavor for many people in this room. Uh, these three have been in the trenches literally and figuratively fighting for issues uh, that aren't always popular. In Washington, the joke is trade is sometimes a four-letter word. Uh, so it requires a constituency supporting and taking the political heat and moving forward. And the panelists, as well as many of you in this room, have done exactly the same thing. Uh, I also want to thank Ken for the opportunity to join all of you and giving me the privilege, and it was a privilege, to run this conversation. And we do have one final item of business, and that is to please join me in thanking our panelists for their terrific conversation. Thank you. Thank you.